This is Michael T. Welcome, dear listeners, to another captivating episode of the Book Party Podcast. Today we have a special treat for you as we delve into the world of psychoanalyst prolific author Gerald Schoenwolf and his latest literary masterpiece, Lizzie, a biographical novel. I can't wait to take you on his fascinating journey into the author's mind, his enigmatic subject. Gerald Schoenwolf is different from your average author. With over 47 years of experience as a psychoanalyst, he's delved deep into the human psyche and ventured into the realms of literature, cinema, and philosophy. In his early career, he authored the academic bestseller 101 Common Therapeutic Blunders, a work that has transcended borders published in seven languages, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Schoenwolf's literary prowess extends beyond psychology with a stunning repertoire of 15 books on the subject. However, it doesn't stop there. He's also penned nine novels, two translations of Chinese philosophy, and even explored the world of poetry. Gerald Schoenwolf's journey hasn't been without its controversies. In the early 1990s, he faced a form of cancellation for his critiques of certain aspects of feminism. Undeterred, he continued to share his insights and creativity, self-publishing many of his works on platforms like Amazon, including the highly regarded Dictionary of Dream Interpretation. But Schoenwolf's talents continue after the written word. He's also a master of the silver screen, having written 20 screenplays, some of which have earned top honors at prestigious film festivals, not content with just writing. He's also taken on the role of producer-director and has brought two feature films to life. Today, this remarkable author calls Bethlehem, Pennsylvania home, where he shares his wife with his Julia, along with a colorful cast of characters, including a parrot named Lucky and two feline companions, Max and Minnie. Now let's turn our attention to his latest literary endeavor, Lizzie, a biographical novel. This captivating work delves deep into the life of one of history's most enigmatic figures, Lizzie Borden. Drawing from many sources, including previous biographies, courtroom records, and her infamous trial, Schoenwolf paints a vivid portrait of Lizzie's life, striving to capture what might have transpired. Lizzie isn't just a factual retelling. It's a masterful work of fiction that explores Lizzie's mind depths. Schoenwolf, armed with his psych psychoanalytic knowledge and a novelist's sensibility, takes us on a journey through Lizzie's eyes. We witness her childhood, the events leading up to the infamous murders, the trial that gripped the nation, and her life afterward, including her intriguing relationship with actress Nance O'Neill, the struggles that led to her eventual demise at age 66, this isn't your typical biography. It's an immersive exploration of a tragic figure a work of literature that goes beyond the boundaries of traditional storytelling. Schoenwolf skillfully employs techniques like streams of consciousness and unconsciousness to delve into Lizzie's most profound thoughts and emotions as she navigates her tumultuous journey. So, dear listeners, prepare to be captivated by the brilliant mind of Gerald Schoenwolf and the enthralling world he's crafted in. Lizzie, a biographical novel. This is a podcast episode you will want to experience as we step into the mind of a psychoanalyst turned author and delve into the complexities of a life that continues to intrigue us to this day. Let's welcome Gerald Schoenwell to the Book Party podcast and embark on this literary adventure together. So, Gerald, why don't you take it from here? Fill in the blanks a bit and tell our listeners about yourself. 
Okay, well, thanks for having me, and thanks for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I uh, so I'm uh, a, a psychoanalyst and an author. I practiced as a psychoanalyst in New York for forty-seven years, uh, and for the first half of my career, I I wrote mainly uh, psychology and psychoanalytic books. Uh, then. Uh, more more recently, I have delved into more creative things like poetry, philosophy, and and nine novels. Um, the one of the last latest novels I've written is called Lizzie, a biographical novel. Uh, Lizzie's Lizzie has been, you know, the fascinate fascinated. She's been a fascinating subject for for many years. Uh, many books have already been written about her. Uh, movies have been made about her. TV movies, uh, but I I thought that nobody has yet really captured her personality. Uh, I thought after doing a year of research on her that I could. Um, I and I decided to do it as a novel so that I would have the freedom to to truly dramatize her story. Uh, the way I th I thought it deserved to be gravitized. Now people have had theories about why Lizzie Borden took an axe and uh, axed her mother and her step her stepmother and her father. Um, what what made her do such a beastly thing? Well, some one theory was that her father uh, sexually abused her. Uh, nobody has really. Uh, dramatized that. So I think my book might be the first that, that goes with that theory and dramatizes it, dramatizes it, because I think it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense after I studied her story. Her, her mother died when she was five years old, and uh, the, the novel starts there. After she was five years old, she was very lonely. Uh, when her mother died, and she had to depend on her father. And, uh, you know, the book details how she kept begging him to sleep with him. And, uh, you know, she she's a, she's a little girl who was, at a certain point, was interested in, um, you know, her father's penis. Uh, when you, you study psychoanalytic research, you, you you notice that children do go through a period where they get very interested in who has what, who has penises, who has vaginas, and so forth. Uh, and uh, so, you know, she was very curious about his penis and kept asking him to show it to her. So one night he did show it to her. And and then he began to touch her and 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 uh, went crazy. And then after he had touched her, he he got angry and accused her of being the devil, because he was a very religious man. Uh, and so this molestation of her uh, set the stage for the book. She uh, she imagined and dreamt that her and her father would get married when she grew up. That's what he would. That's what he told her. Uh, but when she grew up, I mean, a few years later, she, he got married to uh, a, a woman, a, a widower, a widow, and uh, he, he completely abandoned Lizzie. He, uh, she felt abandoned and and angry. And uh, as she grew up to be a an adult, a young adult. Uh, she was very, very jealous of this stepmother, but also this stepmother was a very, uh, a very uh, manipulative and greedy person, and she ended up convincing her father to to give her all of the houses that he owned instead of leaving it to Lizzie and her her older sister, and uh, <clears throat> at one point. That they get so the the father and stepmother get so angry at Lizzie and her caustic tongue that that he goes out and he axes all of her pigeons. She loved her pigeons more than anything else in life, 
and he just went to the shed and axed them all one day because he was so angry at her. Uh, this this led to her getting into a rage. She'd already been in one, but this was her worst rage and ended up motivating her. One day she, she went crazy. She just went crazy. And I go into her craziness with a, you know, <clears throat> with a long stream of consciousness section. And uh, <clears throat> she axes her mother and, and father, stepmother and father. And uh, it's a ver very dramatic scene. And I've, I've followed pretty much the, 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 uh, the actual facts of what happened. Uh, she she asked them, and then various police started coming to the house, and uh, you know she they they all kind of felt sorry for her. They they couldn't believe that such a religious young woman could do such a thing. Um, so she ended up going to trial, and uh, they trial lasted two weeks, and they um, they the, the verdict came up not not guilty, even though there was. Loads of evidence pointed to her guilt. Um, so the book covers that. It covers the trial. It 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 covers a a dance party that she goes to. It it covers a man who was interested in her, and then later in the novel, it uh, it covers uh, what happened after the trial. They she and her sister bought a big house. They lived it up. Uh, in the house, and and she started having an affair with Nance O'Neill, an actress. It was a lesbian affair, and uh, she she uh, invited Nance and her theater troupe over to her house, and uh, you know they they had some wild times. They went swimming in the in a nearby pond, you know, uh, skinny dipping, uh, and. Uh, but the but the relationship with Nance soon ended, and uh, and then she had a tragic death, early tragic death. Now this is just the plot, but I I think the way the book is written is uh, I, I I feel it it has I'm, I'm just I'm the author so I'm biased, but I think it has a Dostoevskian feeling to it, uh, like like Crime and Punishment. Um, I really get into her character, into her mind, into her thoughts, and uh, I think it is it is a, a I've, I think it's a good portrait of her, and, I, and people who have read it also think so, and can't can't lay the book down. Um, that's sort of the gist of it. Well, on your publishing journey, because you've written a lot of books. But on your publishing journey, did you have to self-publish, or did you get an agent and publish, or a hybrid publishing? How did you go about your publishing journey? Well, during the, the first half of my career, I wrote mainly psychology books, uh, plus some, some other books that were more mainstream, and uh, they were published by regular regular publishing companies. But early in my career, I I started criticizing uh, feminists, some of the theories that feminists were proposing. I I criticized them in my book, in my books, and uh, I got horrendous reviews because of that. This this guy is a sexist. This this guy uh, <laughs> hates women, you know. And uh, then after a certain point, I wasn't able to get my books published anymore. I had to start publishing them myself. And so most of my literary work, the novels, uh, I wrote uh, screenplays and uh, books of philosophy. Uh, I published myself on Amazon. And, uh, you know, I have uh, tried to market them myself, not, not very successfully. Uh, I think I've, I've written a lot of Good novels. I think if it it were some other time besides now, I think those novels would have been noticed. But uh, so I'm trying to market them myself, uh, and uh, you know, try to get them into the eyes of readers. 
Right. So this particular one you did self-publish as well. Yes. I so started- when you're doing the when you're doing the self-publishing, are you collaborating for editing, formatting your book cover, or you're doing all that yourself? Well, fortunately, I've had a lot of jobs. I was once a graphic designer uh, before I became a psychoanalyst. And uh, so I know a good deal about book publishing. So I I do everything myself, except I do send the book out to be proofread, you know, by a a professional editor. But everything else, well, the cover design, you know, they have templates that I can use. you know, I I I, t- I typeset the book myself using Microsoft Word, um, and uh, format it, and 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 uh, you know, do that, do all that work myself. So basically, okay. uh, it's it's a, a one person operation. And I I started my own publishing company called Living Center Press. So the books I publish have that, you know. Living Center, published by Living Center Press in uh, in association with uh, Amazon. Oh, uh, okay. So on this uh, this latest book for, for Lizzie, can you take us to a point in writing this book w- that you would consider your worst author moment? The worst author moment? Uh, hmm. It, it's hard to say, you know. I've in, in recent years, I have been very involved in writing, and uh, and very, I really, I really love it. Uh, and you know, in my early days, I had some blocks, but I don't have any blocks now. I just love to write, uh, and uh, I can't say that I had a worse moment. Okay. How about? an epiphany moment where you're doing anything except actually writing. You could be driving, eating, cooking dinner, waking up or going to bed, taking a shower or whatever. And all of a sudden a bright light bulb bursts in your head like, Oh wow. Uh, I that's gotta be in my book. I got to write that down right now. Do you ever have a moment like that? Oh yeah. I have a lot of moments uh, like that. You know, I, I generally do a lot of drafts. I think I must have done about 14 or 15 drafts of Lizzie trying to polish it and, you know, the rewriting the, the, uh, you know, the, the, her, the, the sequences of, uh, her, her thinking and, uh, but, you know, I'll be, yeah, I'll be driving in the car and I'll think, oh, you know what? I need to add another chapter. You know, after like the 14th draft, I thought of a, another chapter that I needed to add. And it was a chapter a chapter right after the uh right after the trial when it's finished. And she gets drunk. She gets drunk in the basement of her house and uh and she says some things that are that are kind of vicious about about the lawyer who represented her. Um, and she's and her, and her sister comes down, and her sister's kind of just gawking at her. Uh, it, so I think this chapter is a very revealing chapter about Lizzie, but I didn't think of it until like the thirteenth draft. So let's turn to today. What is the one thing that you're the most fired up about or excited about right now today? Well. <clears throat> Uh, I'm, I'm fired. I'm fired up about mass murders, uh, and, and uh, I, I wrote another book called "The Mass Murderer: Six Case Histories That Tell Us Why." I'm I'm very caught up with that because I think America has a very disturbed culture right now, uh, and uh, they're they're uh, also the the child rearing uh, in America is has deteriorated over the years. And so I, I I wrote that book, and I'm I'm quite interested in that subject of mass murderers, and uh, 
I think it's something that we that's very important that we need to to do something about and but but we have to understand it the right way because it's not just about guns it, it, it's about a, a disturbed culture <laughs> that's that's correct this is Michael T I would invite you to go to bookpartypodcast.com hit that subscribe tab on top then scroll down to the icon of your choice, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or Odyssey. You can download and follow us there, and please leave a review. Please don't forget to sign up for our weekly video newsletter. Get the latest information on our upcoming shows. Okay, we are entering the lightning round. The lightning round is special because it's four pointed questions. For four pointed answers. Now, for this first one, you're going to have to think way back. And when I say way back, I'm talking about back to your first book you ever wrote. Because when you wrote your first book, before that, what was holding you back from becoming an author in the first place? In my in my younger years, I was. <clears throat> I was pretty messed up. I was pretty messed up, and uh, I I wrote I wrote a novel about myself, which young writers often do. But I had no insight into myself at that point, and so the novel uh, it had some clever techniques in it, but but uh, what I tried to write about, I just I, I didn't have the maturity to write it the way it needed to be written. So that first that first novel, it turned out that I kept writing that for about 30 or 40 years, kept trying to get it right. Uh, but I had to wait for me to mature and have, have a lot of years of, of my own psychotherapy before I was able to get it right enough where I thought it could be published. Once you started writing, what was the best advice that you had ever received? The best advice was S. Somerset Maugham, and he, he, he wrote, the most successful writer is the one who can hold on to his manuscript the longest before sending it out. Huh. Hadn't heard that one before. Share one of your habits that contributes to your success. I, I'm an early bird, so I, I get up 6 o'clock. 5.30 every morning, and in the quiet of the morning, I get my best writing done, and uh, it's uh, it's worked well for me to do that. I have time in different parts of the day. I, I might write some more, but it starts in the early morning. Okay. Can you share with our listeners an internet resource that you use when you write? Well, I I use uh, the the thesaurus. You know, I I use the the, the thesaurus is uh, a lot. I'll I'll stop to try to find the right word. I wanna I wanna get the right word in there, and and I'm glad that we modern writers have that tool. Uh, writers before us didn't have it, uh, so that that's one of the the big things that I use. Okay, we are now going to enter into the grand finale. What I'd like you to do is take your time and tell our listeners about your book. Now, I know you did that in the beginning a bit, but go ahead and, and tell our listeners about your book. Okay, well, I, I think that, you know, right now, I, I, I feel like we, we're not in a, a very good place. As far as literature is concerned, um, I don't. I don't. I think there aren't any Hemingways or Faulkners, or much less Dostoevskys or Chekhovs or uh, um, Voltaire's other other literary types of writers. Uh, I I don't think they're they're here, and I, it's because of the chaotic times that we're living in. That I don't think they support good literature uh but i'm i've tried to write 
good literature, and I, I think Lizzie, uh, a biographical novel, is, I think it's good literature, and I think it goes deep into her personality, into, into what, how she lives, how she functions, what drove her crazy, every step of her craziness, it's all documented, it's all described and dramatized. And I, I think my novel, this, this novel, uh, is, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very polished and fine novel, uh, replete with stream of consciousness and uh, other literary techniques. Uh, I, I think that if it, you know, hits the, <clears throat> hits the uh, bookshops or the uh, wherever it else it needs to go, uh, and and has uh, uh, legs and gets readers. I think it could it could be noticed. Okay, well, Gerald, we thank you so much for being with us here today and opening up to us. I'm sure our listeners appreciate this too. Remember, Gerald's book Lizzie, a biographical novel, is available on Amazon. Again, this is Michael T. To our listeners, I would invite you to go to bookpartypodcast.com, hit that subscribe tab on top, scroll down to the icon of your choice where you can find us on one of your favorite platforms, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or Odyssey. You can download and follow us there. Please leave a review. Don't forget to sign up for our weekly video newsletter to get the latest information on our upcoming shows. Until next time, keep reading, learning, and discovering the world through the pages of a good book. Book Party Podcast is owned and powered by MTM Legacy Publishing. This is Michael T. signing off. You must not miss our next episode as we delve into a world of inspiration, entertainment, and thought-provoking insights. Join Michael T. on the next Book Party podcast and experience a new adventure, a new story, and a complete immersion into the world of Pages Unveiled, Chronicles of the Writing Journey.